Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike Brink from Park Avenue Baptist Church, and I'm so glad you've chosen to spend this time with us. We at Park Ave want to be of help to you, so if you have a prayer request or want to chat about today's sermon, fill out the connection card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for being with us, and we hope you enjoy today's service. Good morning, Park Avenue Baptist Church. Thanks for being with us today. We are in week two of our series, One Nation Under God, uh, because a king and a kingdom is better than a candidate. And so we are looking at some ideas together this month uh, because the things that captivate the headlines these days don't have to captivate our hearts. And we want to have a an attitude and a mindset that helps us to think through the issues of the day uh, in the best possible way we can. Uh, I want to review a little bit some of the things we talked about last week. Uh, we talked about the idea that as ambassadors with a steadfast hope for the future, and that is who we are as Christ followers, uh, we need to be a people who compassionately speak out while others freak out. And too often we are guilty of just joining in the freaking out that's happening all around us. And we, we need to be a people who are different, who respond differently. We talked about the idea that as an ambassador, I'm chosen by God, not elected or appointed by men, and that everything I do represents Jesus. My actions and my words do not just reflect on me. We ended with... Uh, a kind of a reframing for us last week and challenged us with this, that I will choose to live my life on mission for God as a Christ-empowered ambassador, reconciling people who fear to the God who loves. And the big idea that we grappled with last week, and we're just going to keep building on this, is the idea that I'm an American for now and a heavenly ambassador for now. Uh, both of those things are temporary roles for us. Uh, I will be, as a Christ follower, I will be a heavenly citizen forever, but my ambassadorship is temporary, uh, just like my identity as an American is temporary. Well, today we want to move ahead, hit some other concepts that will help us to work together, and we're going to start in a little bit of an unusual place. Uh, and I would like to posit this truth to us all. That drunk people often do not know that they are drunk people. Um, I don't have a lot of experience here. Actually, I have zero personal experience. Um, I haven't used alcohol at all in my lifetime. Well, unless you call Ny Count NyQuil, then maybe. Um, and I haven't been around people uh, a great deal who have used and abused alcohol. Um, so I don't have a lot of personal experience here to draw on, uh, but I believe this to be true, that sometimes people who are drunk don't even know that they're drunk, and there's a very simple reason for this, because we, and when, we, when we are under the influence, a couple things happen. Our guard is lowered, and our judgment is impaired. And so that's often why... Uh, People who are drunk do some really stupid things that they end up regretting later. Uh, but alcohol isn't the only thing that gets us under its influence. Uh, I'm not even talking about other drugs. Uh, our guard can be lowered and our judgment can be impaired by other influences as well. And I wanna look at some of those today and challenge us to do some thinking uh, the big question I want us to grapple with is who's influence, who influences you more, God or culture? Now, we know the right answer here. We know what we're supposed to be able to say. Oh, of course, God, I'm a Christ follower. I'm in church. Uh, of course, God influences me more. But I want to challenge us with what is what is the true answer here? Uh, what truly has greater influence in our lives? Uh, because just like the drunk don't always know that they're drunk, 
Sometimes the influenced don't know whose influence they're under. Uh, for the drunk person, it is such a gradual loss of faculties that they can't even recognize it. And I think for us, it can be much the same. That we're influenced by culture so gradually, it's so incremental for us, that we don't even recognize what's going on. Well, the first portion of scripture I'd like to take us to probably won't be a surprise to anyone. Uh, I want to look at the opening chapter of the book of Daniel. And at this point in uh, the nation of Israel's history, they were freshly experiencing what was known as the Babylonian captivity, where uh, the armies of Babylon came in, conquered, took religious artifacts, but also took some people back to Babylon with them. And it was a very cunning strategy uh, that we're going to learn a little bit about. And so we're going to pick up in uh, Daniel chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, great name there, uh, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. So they took young people as their captives, uh, brought them back to Babylon, and they didn't know whether they would ever see uh, home again. Uh, this was a long-term kind of thing. Verse 4, Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. So, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar wanted the guys who looked the best and the guys who functioned the best, who had smarts, um, because these men were going to be an infusion of fresh life into Babylon. Uh, but they were also going to reprogram these young men with the language and the literature of Babylon. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, take note of that, three years, and then they would enter the royal service. So this was a little different than being a prisoner of war or being a hostage of some sort. These guys were not thrown into jail and subsisting on crusts of bread. They were eating the same food the king and the royalty were eating. These guys were being treated well. So uh, Babylon had a very effective strategy. Immerse them in our culture to wash away their culture. And it worked most of the time, but not this time. Verse 8, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. That's a powerful insight into Daniel's perspective. He made a decision for himself. I don't want to be influenced in all the ways they are trying to influence me. Um, he made a determination. There was nobody else there to make that determination for him. Nobody else that was going to impose a rule or say, are you sure you want to do that? Daniel decided. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. I think it's telling that he asked for permission uh, he did not demand, he did not throw a hunger strike, he made a request. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. I think that's significant because it tells us that God was at work here. Uh, 
God was not left behind in Judah. God was present with Daniel and with the other young men there in the land of Babylon. I want to read a couple of additional verses, um, and then we'll jump back in with some more things up on the screen. So let me read for you, uh, beginning in verse 10 down to verse 17. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other use your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Well, that's a pretty valid concern that he would have. Verse 11, Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. I think it's interesting, first of all, that these guys sought after a diet of only vegetables, which would be the thing most of us would be resisting. Uh, and that verse 17 states for us that God gave them this aptitude and God gave them, uh, gave Daniel this special ability. And so we see um, there was a problem. Daniel made a request. It was countered with a concern and Daniel was able to respectfully counter with, well, why don't we try this? Now, we can wonder, what if at the end of 10 days, um, they hadn't looked healthier? What if they had been looking sickly? What would have happened then? And we don't know. We just know that God came through, and it seems like honored Daniel's step of faith. Uh, we go on... Uh, and consider this mindset that Daniel demonstrated. He said, I am in Babylon for now, but I am a child of God forever. I refuse to think that Babylon is all that matters. That's a pretty significant determination for this young man to make. And we continue on in verse 18. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, how long was that again? Yes, you're right, three years. The chief of staff brought all of the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. When the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Now, I want to make a couple of observations. I, these are going to be staggering for you, so hold on here. First of all, Daniel 1 comes before Daniel 2 through 12. I know that's shocking. But I think it's really important for us to recognize that the choices Daniel made in Daniel 1 made possible all of the events of the rest of the book. If he had not taken a stand here, and, and Daniel didn't know there was going to be a book of Daniel. So far as Daniel knew, he was just a kid who had been taken in this captivity who was uncertain about what the future would hold. He didn't know anything other than that. He didn't know that his 
story was going to be written down and we were going to be talking about it years and years later. So what does this mean for us? Well, there's some really important implications here for us. Today comes before the rest of your life. And the choices you make today, be those good choices or bad choices, make possible all the events of the rest of your life. That's significant. We don't often think about that. We often think, well, it's just today. I'm not really making any important choices. And I would suggest to you that you make very few unimportant choices. Um, which shirt you wear, which cereal you have for breakfast, those things probably don't matter a lot in the grander scheme. But there are a lot of decisions that we make that make a big difference. Uh, we're familiar with this concept of the if-then principle. Uh, that if I choose this, then there are some things that will naturally result. Uh, we make allowance, allowances for these things in the physical world, but often we don't carry that over to the spiritual world. So uh, I'm going to start with food because I figure that I'm implicating myself as much as anyone else. So if I choose to eat three Big Macs as part of my daily diet plan for 2020, then I probably won't lose weight. Okay, so there's an if and there's a then. There's a part that I choose and a predictable result. And we understand that. We see something like that in terms of diet and we're like, well, I don't like that reality, but I acknowledge that reality. But too often we miss this in terms of our spiritual life. So let me throw you another hypothetical, another if then. If I choose to read my Bible only when I feel like it, then I probably won't grow in my knowledge and confidence in God. Uh, we're not as comfortable with the if-thens in our spiritual life because we feel like, well, but, but I mean to love God. So surely he knows that and he's going to bring about the results. And surely I mean to... Uh, spend more time in God's Word, but life is busy, and there's so much information coming at me, and there's this really good show that I want to watch. And sometimes we go through a string of days and suddenly realize that God's Word has gotten squeezed out. And I want us to make sure we understand that it's not that God loves us more after we check off, yep, spend, spent 15 minutes, spent a half an hour, spent two hours reading the Bible today. It's that spending time in God's Word gives Him the opportunity to show us who He is, show us who we are, and show us how much we need Him. It gives us the opportunity for growth. Second big idea I want us to grapple with here is that Daniel 1 may have been the beginning of Daniel's book, but it's not the beginning of Daniel's story. Uh, there was a foundation that had been laid during the good pre-captivity days in Judah that prepared Daniel for the bad days. Bad days that he didn't even know were coming. It's not like he and his family had marked on the calendar, okay, so there's this uh, Babylonian invasion coming up, and when they come in here, they're going to take our son away, and we're never going to see him again. So let's make sure we plan in light of what we know is coming. They did not know what was coming. So they had made some choices along the way, and these choices, uh, we can go all the way back and look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, I want to read a couple verses, uh, and then I want to highlight a few things for us. But this was instruction that God was giving to the nation of Israel on how to proceed uh, in obedience. So let me read for you the first five verses from this passage. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. 
And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord, your God, as long as you live. If you obey all of his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. That sounds a lot like an if-then. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your strength, all your soul, uh, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, excuse me. And then he continues, and he says this, verse 6, verse 7, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. And then he continues, and I had a few more verses that I wanted to read there, um, beginning in verse 9. Uh, Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig, and you will eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord and serve him. When you take an oath, you must use only his name. And then verse 14, he says, You must not worship any of the gods of neighboring nations, for the Lord your God, who lives among you, is a jealous God. And jealousy is one of those things that really looks very, very ugly on people, so we think of it as a negative characteristic But when God is jealous for us, that's a beautiful, beautiful, protective thing. I want to jump down to verse 20. Uh, I'd encourage you to read down through the rest of this chapter on your own. Great stuff here. But verse 20. uh, In the future, your children will ask you, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? Then you must tell them, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give our ancestors. That's another beautiful if then. And then we hit verse 24. And the Lord our God commands us to obey all these decrees and to fear him. Why? So he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives as he has done to this day. Now, we could say, well, couldn't God continue to bless them and preserve them even if they didn't obey. Well, he could, except that would be contrary to his character as a good parent. He says, I want them to obey, not because I'm trying to ruin anything for them, but because I'm trying to protect them. And obedience will allow them to live the best life possible, and that will allow me to continue to bless them and preserve them. It's interesting that word continue He had already been blessing them and preserving them. And God makes clear, I want to continue to do the same. The foundation established in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is what Daniel stood on. 
in Daniel chapter 1. What does that mean for us? Well, I'd ask you this question. Have I been establishing a sturdy foundation of knowing and obeying God on the good days that will hold me steady on the bad days? You see, it's not enough to just kind of coast our way through and say, yeah, when bad, got, when bad times come, then I'll turn to God. It's going to be a very limited effectiveness. We have to start building now. So I want to jump back to the Daniel story for a moment, and I want to imagine together how things could have gone. Let's go to verse 5. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchen. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. What if Daniel had chosen differently? What if? But Daniel was determined not to make waves about eating the food and wine given to them by the king. After all, it was good food and everybody else was eating it. His parents wouldn't approve, but they weren't there. And if God didn't want him eating Babylonian cuisine, maybe he shouldn't have allowed him to be taken captive. Remind you of anyone? Reminds me of me and the way that I am prone to respond when God does something I do not understand. Just like Babylon had a very effective strategy, so does Satan. Satan has a very effective strategy. Immerse us in worldly culture to drown out ambassadorial priorities. Ambassadorial. I love that. That was a new word for me, and I'm very proud of it to be able to use it today. We lose sight of our priorities as ambassadors for heaven when we get so caught up in everything that's going on around us in this world, and we get attached, and we allow it to influence us. Now, Satan's strategy of immersion and drowning out it works a lot, but it doesn't have to. And so today, I just want to call us to high alert of what dangers are we walking toward. So again, who influences you more, God or culture? I want to utilize a couple of very familiar verses for us. I want to challenge us. Uh, I want to double dog dare you to take this journey with us this morning. Uh, Psalm 139, that chapter closes out with these verses. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Man, that's a gutsy prayer. Point out anything in me that offends you. God, nothing is off limits. If, if it's interfering with our relationship, God, I want to know about it. And that's powerful. So as we close things out, I just want to hit, hit you with some application um, and not just let us dodge this as an abstract thing. So I have five uh, that we're going to hit on real quick. First of all, who influences your entertainment standards more, God or culture? Oh, yeah. Pastor Mike's doing that meddling thing again. So in terms of what you choose to read, what you choose to watch, what you choose to listen to, is this pleasing to God? Do you even bother to ask the question, do you even wrestle with that at all? Or do you just indiscriminately consume whatever is laid before you by our culture? That's a serious question for us to grapple with. Are we submitting our entertainment choices to God or are we just swept along by culture? Secondly, who influences your financial priorities more, God or culture? 
When you look at the things around you, when you look in your wallet or in your bank account, is your first thought, this belongs to me, what do I want to buy? Or is your first thought, this belongs to God, what does he want me to do? You see, we can chase after a lot of things saying, well, but I need that to be happy. If I get that, I'm sure I'll be happy. And those things don't make us happy. Many times we find ourselves deeper and deeper in debt, owning things that didn't satisfy us, that we're now going to spend the next couple of years paying for while we don't enjoy them. That's ridiculous. When we acknowledge that God is in charge of our finances, we are available to serve. We're flexible. We're able to respond however he leads us. Third, who influences the way you use your words more? God or culture? Are the way you use your words God-honoring? Do you help build, build people up or do you tear them down? Is your life characterized by gossip, by talking about other people negatively, uh, by being critical? Is it characterized by foul language and by suggestive comments? Do you, does the way you talk make you sound just like everybody else? Or is there something different that people notice in the way you talk? Fourth, who influences the way you use your time more? God or culture? I'm not trying to be cutesy, but do you spend more time in his book or on Facebook? What gets more of your attention? Uh, how do you spend your time? We are guaranteed no moment beyond this one. It is a foolish thing to say, I'll get to God later, because you're not guaranteed a later. And lastly, who influences where you find your identity and worth more? God or culture? Too often, and I, it's true for me, that I get wrapped up in, well, what will people think of me? Will they like me? Will they approve of me? Rather than going, I know who I belong to. I know what he says is true of me. Now, I want to live in light of that truth. I don't have anything I need to prove. I don't have anything I need to earn. It's already been given to me. Now I just need to live in response to that. And I recognize that that is easier said than done. I want to close with one last verse from 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. This is a divine division of labor. Uh, too often, we're trying to lift ourselves up in honor, and it's not working. It's not what we're asked to do. What's my part of the task? My task is to humble myself before God. His part, when he decides it's the right time, in, in whatever way he decides, then he gets to lift me up in honor. His way, not my way. Daniel didn't know he was going to be exalted and given influence. All he knew is, I have a choice. Am I going to leave for these people around me, or am I going to determine not to defile myself before my God? Daniel made a choice with no idea of the outcome. The same is true for David and for Joseph and he longs to do the same for you and I. But we have to take the first step and say, I will humble myself, not so that he will then exalt me. That's manipulation and God doesn't fall for that, but because it's the good and right thing for me to do. So 
Closing thought. Just like Daniel had to realign his identity and his priorities, we get to do the same. We get to say, I am an American for now, and I'm thankful. But I am a child of God forever. And I refuse to think that this world, that this nation, that this election is all that matters. Now, do those things matter? Yes, they do. But there is so much more. And we need to be a people who are willing to see it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for examples like Daniel um, in your word that help us to recognize how vitally important our decisions can be, even the small, ordinary decisions that, that we think are inconsequential. Oftentimes they're, they're bigger than we can imagine. I thank you for the influence of godly parents in Daniel's life and that some of these principles had provided him with a foundation that allowed him to handle difficult circumstances well. God, would you help us to be people who build that kind of foundation with our daily choices and our daily priorities so that we can be ready? Daniel ended up being an ambassador for you. Uh, they wanted to eradicate his culture and exalt Babylonian culture. And in a bizarre twist, the kind that you delight in God, he influenced Babylonian culture. God, how do you want to use us? Help us to be ready and available for you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us. I hope you were encouraged today and challenged, and I hope you have a great week. God bless.